Thanks a lot for the introduction, Rob. Um, so hello everyone from Belgium. Uh, hello everyone from Europe and the rest of the world. I'm sitting over here in Belgium. Uh, it is very nice weather over here. And we are, you know, in luck that nothing is happening over here regarding any, you know, physical wars or whatever, right? So I, I would say uh, to Ukraine, all the best. Uh, keep up the good work, keep up the, uh, the good defenses and good luck, everyone. I mean, we're there for you. Now, if we are here on looking at the Russian cyber army, you have to know that they have a lot of, you know, very well advanced, very capable groups uh, that are linked to multiple of their intelligence agencies. As we can see here on the right, we have the FSO at the moment. There are no cyber groups linked to them, but who knows? Maybe our retribution hasn't, isn't going as far yet. Then on the FSB, we have two groups, Turla and APT29. But as you can see, the SVR is apparently also linked to APT29. So when we're talking about these activity groups, right, about all of these threat actors that you see in public reports from Mandiant and from Kaspersky and from FireEye and Microsoft and so on and so on, all of these activity groups might be multiple groups behind it, might be multiple real life intelligence agencies that are behind all of this. So keep that in mind when you're doing attribution, when you're thinking of the Russian cyber uh, army in, in general. Uh, one of the big reasons that you know attribution is really really hard is just because of this right the all of the things that we see here all of the different activities we see over the course of multiple years if we look at turla he, they are active since at least 1996 uh when they did the moonlight maze case now all of this activity that we've seen over the years it is well possible that this was performed by a lot of different people but using you know the same same kind of infrastructure, same kind of tooling, maybe even the same kind of standard operating procedures. Uh, they also have a very well administered kind of system uh, where they say, well, if we do that kind of attack, we use these kind of tools, we use these tactics, we use these techniques. If we also look at the different intelligence agencies in Russia, we do see some overlap between certain groups and there might be some kind of partnership between all of them. But I've also heard some whispers that there's apparently a lot of competition going on too. I would imagine that in a lot of other countries, you can see the same between these kind of intelligence agencies, right? Now, last things is if we look at the, um, the criminal groups, there have been sayings that the criminal groups also have worked with the FSB, have worked with the GRU and other intelligence agencies in Russia. Uh, some might be forced, some might be just collaborating with them, getting some money out of it, uh, who knows. But in the last leak that we saw from Conti, we could see in the chats that there were some connections with the FSB, right? That there were some collaborations going on with the FSB and the Conti group, which is a criminal group mostly. So is it possible that a criminal group like Conti will attack somebody or will attack a certain country or company in the interest of the Russian state? Yes, it is possible. But for us to attribute all of this, it is really, really hard. Because when do you deviate between this is definitely done by Russia or done by Conti, but in the interest of Russia and the other one, right? And just, I want money. It is very hard to do that as Rob already explained when we're looking at the cyber war. Next, please. If we look here at a timeline of cyber attacks, and I must say a big thank you to the Cyber Peace Institute. They are doing a lot of good work at getting all of this on one side, on one page. Uh, the links will be in the blogs later on. But if we look at what has been going on in the last couple of years, we could see that in 2015, there was that first big attack. There were a couple of little ones before that, but there was that first big, you know, physical attack on the power grid in Kiev. That was attributed to Sandworm. A year later, we saw another power grid attack uh, attributed to Electrum by Dragos, but they say that it has overlap, it has some links with the Sandworm group again. Now, the Sandworm group seems to be related, seems to be attributed to the GRU, uh, so the military unit. And they have also apparently been uh, executing the NotPetya attack in 2017, which caused a lot of issues in the rest of Europe, 
and the rest of the world. I think a biggest example is the Marsk company that had a lot of impact. I think total impact was like $10 billion or something. Uh, so that was huge. Uh, did they target them? I guess not. I guess their intent was only to target Ukrainian companies, but there was some collateral damage there. And as far as I see, the collateral damage was even bigger than what happened in Ukraine itself. In 2018, still active, we see VPN filter being used in an attack on a chlorine distillation system. And then, you know, there's a, some gap. Uh, maybe we didn't see anything. Maybe it just wasn't released uh, to the community. But later on in 2022, beginning of this year, we saw the Whispergate wiper. And we've seen, as we will see here, a lot of wipers. I won't go into detail on everything here. Um, it is on the Cyber Peace Institute. It is here on the slides. But we'll see three, four wipers. We'll see multiple defacements of on the 14th and 15th of January, for example, uh, governmental websites that are defaced, DDoSes on governmental websites, some of them attributed, some of them not yet. Uh, SMS spam campaigns, disinformation campaigns using social media. Uh, for example, here on the 15th of February, where they just told the people, hey, ATMs are malfunctioning. There is something wrong. So they wanted to kind of disturb the country, annoy everyone, uh, maybe create some panic uh, in, in Ukraine. Next slide, please. If we then go a little bit further on the 23rd of February, we see again some DDoS attacks. We see that second wiper, Hermetic wiper, which is also known as Foxplate, a uh, name given by Microsoft. The first one was name, was name given by ESET. Uh, 24th, again, we see multiple things happening. This was right the day you know, 24th, 25th, where the actual physical attacks started happening. So there we saw DDoS attacks on the Kiev Post news site. We saw Isaac Wiper on governmental entities. These things, they spread either through, you know, a worm called Hermetic Wizard or just putting, you know, hacking the, uh, the Active Directory, setting a GPO and saying, hey, push all of this to all of the machines using the standard Windows functionalities. Put it there, execute, and we're done, right? So be careful, monitor your Active Directory there. Uh, phishing delivery of a certain Sunseed malware, the Viasat KSAT modem attack that happened on the 24th, 25th of February. Another wiper attack, which is, well, we know that there was a wiper attack, but we don't know much in public about what is going on there on a border control station in Ukraine, maybe to annoy people and to make sure that uh, it was harder to get out of Ukraine. Who knows here? Um, Ukraine universities that were compromised. This is a special case, right? This is the uh, a group called the MX on day or MX zero on day. It is a group, a criminal group that is uh, attributed to Brazil, right? Why would they go to Russia? Why would they uh, do something for Ukraine? Well, we'll see that a little bit later where we see that a lot of criminal groups are actually aligning with either Ukraine or with Russia. Well, there's one that doesn't really know it yet what they want to do, but you need to know if you're doing some attribution, like what are we looking at? Are we looking at somebody doing something in their own interest and thinking this is good for Russia or this is good for Ukraine? Or are we actually seeing attacks from the state itself? This information again, where they use LinkedIn accounts, where they use uh, compromised accounts in emails and so on and so on, all of that being used to misinform people. Uh, in the next presentation by Nico, he will say a lot more about this, but we do see all of these attacks uh, just before the disinformation campaign is happening, where they are trying to compromise social media accounts, where they're trying to compromise email accounts and so on. Next slide. If you look at uh, the 4th of March, there were some NGOs, some charities that were also attacked. Uh, these charities were actually trying to get people out of Ukraine, were trying to get money over there to bring some support to, uh, to Ukraine. And a lot of them were attacked by uh, malicious actors. On the 5th, we see some phishing attacks again. On the 7th, we have some credential harvesting. And credential harvesting has been going on for you know, a while now. Uh, we see it a lot all over the world uh, where credential harvesting is a big thing. It is an interesting initial access point. Just get some credentials from somebody, send a phishing mail, and uh, get into their system using the VPN, for example. 
If you look at some malware spreading campaign by UNC 1151, the ones that are behind a lot of the disinformation campaigns, uh, they started spreading the micro backdoor. Then there was a factory reset attack on the Triolan uh, telecom network. Now the Triolan telecom network is an ISP, a telecommunications company in the west of Ukraine that was suddenly out for a couple of hours and um, nobody at the first knew what was going on. Well, apparently it was a cyber attack where their systems were just put to factory uh, settings. And of course, if you put everything to factory settings, it, there's a big chance that things won't work anymore. Another wiper here on the 14th of March. So they keep on developing these wipers. I don't know if they have some kind of framework. The strange thing is that the, uh, the malware engineers, the malware reverse engineers, they don't seem to find a lot of overlap between them. There is some overlap sometimes, but for example, in this caddy wiper attack, um, I haven't seen a report yet where they say, well, there's a specific overlap with that wiper or with that wiper. So I guess more analysis will see some more information later in the future. And then another, um, you probably all saw that deep fake video of the Ukrainian president Zelensky uh, that was shared on Telegram, later on shared all over the, all over the place, of course. Uh, you could see that it was deep fake. Nico will go in there uh, a bit more. But there was at the same time, that same day, the news sticker, like the little bar on the news website of the Ukraine 24 TV station, uh, that was actually spreading the same kind of disinformation, saying, hey, you should lay down your weapons, stop fighting the Russians, right? The president says so. So we need to be careful of all of these kind of attacks. Go to the next slide, please. And what have we observed so far? I mean, we've seen it in the timeline there, but just a little overview for you. What are the most important kind of attacks that we've seen and that you should protect yourself against? DDoSes. DDoSes were big. I mean, not only in Ukraine, but also in the rest, uh, the rest of Europe, the rest of the, of, the, um, of the international view. There's a lot of public reports about DDoSes against multiple organizations. Destructive wipers, as we've seen four of them now. Uh, espionage attacks. And here, you know, we'll go into that later, but not only from Russia, okay? Uh, some defacements of websites, influence operations, disinformation, all of that combined. There were a lot of these attacks and some of them happened on the same day to just cause a lot of confusion and to cause a lot of, you know, disturbance within Ukraine. Now beware of false flag operations. I've said so last time too, but there are still, you know, public reports uh, that talk about possible false flag operations where the Russians are trying to point in other directions, or maybe the researchers are just seeing activity from other actors uh, kind of profiting from the situation. Next slide, please. If we see, if we look at the important activity groups, uh, same thing, not, must, not much has changed here, but we definitely need to look at Sandworm, uh, APT20, APT20, APT28, and 29 are still very active. Uh, we have Turla, we have the DEF0586, which hasn't been given a big name yet. It's still that development name given by Microsoft. Um, they seem to be the activity group that uh, executed the Whispergate wiper attack. Then we have Gamma Redon, very active at the moment. And of course, UNC1151. Um, which has also an overlap with Ghostwriter, seems to be a Belarus APT. But of course, we can never forget Moon Knight Maze here. Next, please. Now, here I come to the slide where I give this overview and thank you for uh, CyberNo20 uh, Twitter account. They do a lot of work. I don't know if there's one person behind it or multiple people, but they do a lot of great work kind of putting everything together and saying what well, this criminal group, this APT group, this nation state group is aligning with Ukraine or with Russia or with you know, something else unknown, for example, uh, in the case of Comte, because there was some internal uh, disturbance there, which caused the leak. Now, if you look at Ukraine, for example, you see there on the left side, a lot of anonymous related groups, uh, little groups that, that seem to relate to anonymous, seem to act as in the name of anonymous. Uh, but not the main anonymous group, just some little groups on the side. Uh, these are all people doing it for themselves, right? Trying to help Ukraine in their own way. Is this good? Is this bad? I can't, you know, I don't know for sure there, 
but try to, if you're attributing, if you're doing, or if you're looking at certain attacks, keep that in mind that these kind of hacktivist groups, the nation state groups from Ukraine, from Russia, if you go a little bit down in the table, and then the pro-Ukrainian criminal groups and the pro-Russian criminal groups on the left bottom and on the right side, all of these have nothing really to do, except for the nation states, of course, have nothing really to do with the state itself. It is, of course, possible that they are asked to do something in the name of the state or that they are paid to do something in the name of the state. But here on this slide, we can already see that they actually said, well, we align with that one, we align with that one, uh, with Ukraine or Russia. And uh, they act a lot of the times in their own name, are, tr are just trying to help their own country or you know, whoever they sided with um, in what way they think is possible. Now, if you look at these kind of attacks, right? There, there are some of them that, that did some work and some of them uh, that were annoying for one or the other country. But one attack I really want to look into is the attack uh, that happened just, to, just before the weekend where we saw that NPM package, so the Node.js package manager that was distributing an update for the, um, what's it called again? Uh, for the IPC package and that package is used in so many different pieces of software. Everybody just updated the package from the NPM, just from the standard NPM packet, package manager. They updated their system, they updated their own libraries, their own software using that uh, little library and the NPM package manager. And if you were Russian, apparently some files were just removed, some files were changed, some files were wiped, and you suddenly saw messages there saying, hey, stop the war. In a way, okay, cool, you know, he asked people to stop the war and say, hey, I say no to the war. Uh, it's doing some activism in a way. But this also shows us, shows us how, uh, in a way, insecure and, and uh, risky these kind of public package managers are. So if you're using something like NPM or PyPy or whatever public manager there is, please check these packages before you implement them in your own software. Please check the updates. What, you know, what was going on? What have we seen? Uh, what are the changes in the, um, in the open source uh, code there? Try to check these before you put them in your own software. If you're a commercial company and you're using open source software like that, uh, you might end up with a certain lawsuit against you if you impacted your customers in, the, in Russia, for example. So follow the CyberNo20 and uh, you will find more information on all of these uh, groups there. Uh, next slide, please. Here is uh, just a review of the overlap matrix that I made last time. This is still ongoing work. So uh, what you see here is just looking at what kind of techniques in the MitreTech framework do we see? What uh, kind of techniques do we see being used by multiple groups? For example, the dark red ones uh, are used by all of the groups, by all of the five groups that I was looking into here. And then the green ones are used by one or maybe two groups. And there you see the changes in color. Now, if you want to prioritize, start with the dark red ones and go to the less prioritized or the less used techniques to see if they uh, def or if you defend well or not. Next one. Now, how do we start building our defenses? This is just a quick introduction where, you know, we start with collecting. We start with collecting information about our own intrusions. These are the most important ones. Start doing some intrusion analysis, start, start building your own activity groups, start looking at who is attacking me, what is happening, what kind of techniques are they doing. Then go and look at your public reports, at private reports, reports you receive from you know, an ISAC, a sector group that you're in, uh, a trusted group with other companies uh, that are of the same type, um, with other companies in the same country, things like that. Share as much information as possible, TOP Amber or White. I don't really care about that, right? Just make sure that the information there is shared between all of you and start building your defenses based on that information. Don't try to do everything. Now, if you're, if you're trying to you know, build your defenses and Mick later on will tell a lot more about this, we'll really go in depth here. Um, try to go and use the MitreTech framework. There is the Detect framework made by the Rabobank. 
uh, also the defense framework made by MITRE. And if you want to see how we can build activity groups, how we can build our own uh, intrusions, uh, look at our own intrusions, and from those build activity groups using the diamond model, you can also go and to the SANS website and follow the Forensics 578 course. Next, please. Now we are going to the danger zone, right? So I looked at what is going on here with Russia. What do we see from Russia? But I also want to highlight a couple of things that I've seen within the community in Europe, but also in the rest of the world uh, that I just want to highlight quickly. Next, please. Beware of your fallacies. Beware of your biases. I mean, we all think in a certain way. We have a certain context. We have a certain background, a certain culture, and we all think what is good, what is bad. But keep in mind that this bias, this logical fallacy that you have can really annoy your analysis, can really impact your analysis uh, when you're thinking of certain attacks. If we go into a first example on the next slide, you will see, for example, the illusory correlation. So if we go into illusory correlation, a big example that we see a lot is, you know, full moon and back in the days was full moon causes um, the, um, the werewolves, things like that. But also sometimes in hospitals, you can see whew, nurses talking, you know, every time it's full moon, there, is, there are a lot of hospital admissions. It's crazy and all the special cases that we have. And it always happens on full moon day or full moon night. Now, when there's no full moon, there's probably as much hospital admissions sometimes, right? But they just don't, you know, they don't see that connection. They don't really value that connection. And people don't really think about it anymore. So there you can see that there's like a certain link. The link is not there, but because of some reason, people make the illusion that the link is there. That is illusory correlation. So what I see here in real life is that people, for some reason, start attacking Russian citizens or, or Russian people, Russian-speaking people living in Europe. They start attacking them and saying, oh, it's your fault that Ukraine is being, be, being, uh, being fought or Ukraine is at war. Why? I mean, they have nothing to do with the whole situation in Ukraine and Russia. They are not Putin. They don't decide what's going on. So beware of that correlation there. It's, it's, not, it's an illusion. If, only if you can see that he really called with Putin and uh, kind of ordered Putin to do this or that, you could tell, you could say that. But please stop attacking Russian citizens, Russian companies, just because they are Russian. If you have other reasons for suspicions, of course. I mean, do your analysis, go ahead. But if you're just for that, uh, try to not make any assumptions on these kind of links. Next uh, danger, please. So if we go to danger two, we have correlation is not causation. The idea there is that we see links, you know, we see multiple links everywhere. And at a certain point, we might think of a certain cause, but the cause is actually not the real cause. Little here is if you wake up with your shoes and you have a headache, you might relate those things. But actually, it is just because you were drunk the day before that you fell asleep with your shoes on, you woke up with your shoes on, and now your head hurts. So there, the cause is you were drinking, not the shoes that are giving you a headache, right? Next slides. Here is an example in real life uh, with, the ex with the Russian situation. So at a certain point on the 25th, there was a lot of chatter online about communications being disrupted for the Ukrainian military. Uh, a couple of days later, there were reports that 5,800 wind turbines were disrupted in Germany. Uh, there were some other reports, you know, all over Europe that were things were going on in multiple countries that there was some impact for some things but nobody actually knew what was really going on so some people said well Russia is attacking Europe here right we need to go into the highest mode of emergency Russia is attacking Europe it is not only Ukraine that they are attacking now be careful of that this was not true so next please yeah so this was not true and if we go to the next slide the actual reason that all of these things happened all at the same time was because there was a cyber attack that disabled a lot of modems, you know, thousands of modems that were interfacing with the Viasat KSAT satellite, the satellite that is kind of, you know, giving telecommunications to Europe and especially to Ukraine, uh, which was attacked has not been attributed yet. Um, I've saw an, I saw an article that Mandian is apparently working on that. So um, hopefully they will come out with some information later on that will help the community. But as far as we know, it is a cyber attack and uh, that actually caused all of these issues here. 
If you go to danger tree, here we can look at the appeal to probability. I've seen a lot of people, if there is any chatter on LinkedIn or on Twitter or whatever, and they see an attack against some company anywhere in Europe, but especially in Ukraine, of course, everybody's always like, oh, it were the Russians. It is so likely that it were the Russians. You're appealing to probability there. Please stop doing these kind of things. It's not because in, in the past we saw a lot of attacks that were actually attributed to Russia, and we saw all of these attacks against Ukraine, that now every new cyber attack we see uh, on an Ukrainian organization is Russia. I've actually read an article yesterday where apparently the Chinese are making use of the whole situation in Ukraine and are doing an espionage campaign against uh, Ukrainian organizations. So beware of the appeal to probability. If we go to danger four, don't forget about the others, right? It's not only Russia. We have a lot of offensive capable countries in the entire world that have done cyber espionage, that have done other attacks against multiple countries, against multiple organizations. Uh, criminals are not only living in, in, in Russia, right? So don't forget about those. Try to keep those in mind. And if you're doing your analysis, keep track of all of the actors. The six or seven actors that I told you about in the beginning of the presentations were the one that we are focusing on for this war, for the war between Russia and Ukraine. But we are still tracking a bunch of other actors that have attacked Belgium in the past, for example. So keep those in mind. If you look at your own organization, don't forget about the other cyber criminals, about the other cyber actors in the world. Next, please. Last but not least, get some sleep. Okay, I've seen a lot of people breaking down because they were working so much on the whole situation. They were really going crazy and they, they either made mistakes, they broke down, their analysis was really, really bad at a certain point. So just make sure that you get some sleep and your work will be so much better if you get your amount of sleep in, if you get some rest and take a little break now and then. Next one, please. This is where we will end the presentation. So here's just some resources where you can follow the situation. Uh, Cert UA is doing a really good job at sharing all of that information. And if you go to the next one, here we can conclude that Russia is a powerful actor. As far as we know, they have not started the, you know, what people think the cyber war. Are they capable? Maybe, uh, but we have not seen it yet. They are definitely doing strategic attacks. They are definitely meddling in the situation, uh, using their attacks to uh, get their own or meet their own strategic objectives. So beware of them and uh, beware of uh, who's behind, you know, all of these kind of attacks, both criminal and state actors. Thank you.